Thanks very much. Um, thank you all for joining us today. The, uh, the subject of invasive pests in urban forests is a really an enormous subject, one that could be a full day seminar somewhere, somehow, but not today. And um, rather than spend a lot of time specifically getting into detail on how to address invasive pests as a city, I will say that while we'll talk to some degree on city issues, concerns, and directions, if there are any folks from cities here who need specifics like writing of bids and uh, how to educate and train and what to do with city councilors and the politicians and how to reach out to homeowners in that vein as a city forester, we're happy to spend some more time with you offline and get into much more detail. We do that with many cities today, uh, and any of my people or Zach uh, are happy to help you with that. So with, with no further ado, let's just, get, let's just jump right into things. <clears throat> there are differences when we talk about urban forestry. And while it may be obvious, urban forestry involves trees in constructed, unnatural environments, non-native soils oftentimes, and they're facing stressors like roads, salt, heat, root restriction, and, oh, a thousand potential resident managers, the person who owns the house behind the tree. <clears throat> so it's clearly different than dealing with forests uh, in, in their native environment. The trees are planted in monoculture settings. They increase the risk of significant pest outbreaks. You can't help but wonder if we didn't plant ash trees everywhere in the Midwest after the elms died, whether emerald ash borer would have had the ability to spread so rapidly. Thousands of one species can be attacked very simply by moving from tree to tree. The picture I show you there is actually in Michigan, and this is, this is the reality in the early years of emerald ash borer there. Now, some people love trees. Others are at best uninterested, and we've all met both of those types. And a few people recognize, or rather, a few people recognize that a tree is in trouble until it's late in the decline. They wake up one morning, and the tree doesn't look good, and they call, probably you. <clears throat> Urban forestry is truly a challenging career. Invasive insects and diseases should be important to everyone in the PHC field. Native pests co-evolved with their native plants. I mean, it seems to make sense. And in general, they're in equilibrium with those pests. We'll explain that a bit further in a moment. So equilibrium means that those pests will take out weak trees, wounded trees, or feed on but won't kill the host species. Now, this is the general rule of, thing, of things in, in, in a place where the insects and the trees co-evolved. But climate change is making native pests more lethal um, one great example of that is mountain pine beetle, a pest that is not uh, an invasive, but has spread rapidly because of warming forests. If native pests killed all the trees, thinking about this, both the pests and those trees might have died out long ago. So when one considers a, uh, a pathogen or a, an insect that is uh, effective at what it does, it doesn't kill the thing it needs to feed on. Uh, it would be kind of like humans planting a crop of corn and then eating all of that corn and leaving none of the seed to make some more corn. So these trees and those pests that were in those kinds of relationships would not have survived to today. Whereas non-native invasive pests are not in equilibrium with native trees, that results in more damage and um, more death, quite frankly. The increases in invasive pests in the United States have been enormous. And frankly, it's the same throughout the world. I was uh, pointed out from a gentleman who came from China that we've sent many pests to China in the same way that Asia has sent a lot of pests to the United States. This is just a small list of some of the most serious uh, of the uh, invasive insects in the United States. You'll probably recognize some yourself, whether you're on the East Coast, West Coast, or in Florida. Uh, these pests are prevalent throughout the country. Let's talk about non-natives versus the climate. Um, in their native countries, many of these pests, which are tree killers here, only kill the weak trees over there. In this country, the native trees lack the effective defenses against those non-native pests. So there are specific chemicals that are typically found in the phloem of the tree 
And for those of you that don't know what phloem is, it's one of the outermost portions of the tree that allows for uh, for uh, the movement uh, down the tree of carbohydrates and also uh, water. So terpenes and phenols are some of those chemicals that are used in the trees to defend against insects, but they literally have different terpenes and phenols and defense mechanisms from one place to another. And so we don't have those uh, in, in the United States for pests that have evolved in uh, 6,000 miles away. A recent study showed that a, a changing climate is causing plants to shift, shift their ranges both north and westward. And this is really fascinating. The conifers are moving north, and deciduous trees are moving west. And when I say west, I'm talking about away from the east coast and towards the center of the country. And the reasons are very interesting as well. Movement north is more temperature dependent. It's getting warmer in the south and progressively warmer in the north, and therefore many of the movements are tied to temperature for the northernmost movement, whereas movement west is moisture dependent. The movement that they're seeing right now is about 15 miles per decade. And the movement west is occurring at higher rates than north. So the main reason for movement westward is because of increasing moisture in the center of the country. In fact, annual increases in precipitation have averaged around six inches a year. Now, decades-long movement sounds rather slow, but remember, the last change that occurred like this was eight to 10,000 years ago, and it took millennia for these movements to occur, not two decades. Southern and eastern trees are under pressure by insects, moving faster and due to less favorable tree conditions, because the southeast is seeing more drought stress and higher temperatures. As an example, the southern pine beetle, for those of you that are not from the northeast, is now reaching into northern New England. This is a serious problem that we never saw north of Virginia uh, just a decade ago. So what's the role of science in invasive research? Scientists must identify pests, understand life cycles, and deliver solutions to prevent destruction of urban forests. That's what science's role is. But they have all kinds of challenges, limited funding, delayed recognition of pest pressures and pests being present, and understanding their annual life cycles. Experimentation with treatment options, rates, methods, it requires years to verify the conclusions, and the destruction and the damage continues. The other thing that we have to keep in mind, and, and I wish this were not the case, but research organizations can have competing priorities. They have egos. And, and I once thought that scientists could not be put into the realm of having egos. Uh, but there are fights for grant money, and this can impact the identification of the best solutions. So do quarantines help? Well, USDA APHIS, which stands for the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, is our first line of defense in preventing invasive pests from spreading after they enter the United States. It's very important that you understand that their role is eradication of the pest. It is not control of the pest. They're not trying to simply limit it. They're trying to eradicate it. It's an important distinction because they employ aggressive solutions like the one in the picture, um, and they often prefer tree removal to tree treatment. If pests can't be eradicated, then the management falls to local government, private applicators, and citizens. And while APHIS was successful with Asian longhorn beetle in each of the locations where it has uh, appeared, they were not so with emerald ash borer. The APHIS folks were actually in charge of the emerald ash borer in the early years. And what did they try? They tried a large scale, uh, often um, up to an acre, I'm sorry, up to a mile to a mile and a half of clear cutting all of the trees in an area where it existed. And inevitably, emerald ash borer had moved beyond the clear cut options. And when they finally gave up on this, having spent millions of dollars trying to eradicate it, they made a mistake in a statement that they made. And they said, we can't stop it. And why was that a mistake? In a sense, it was true. They couldn't stop it. But it took us years and others um, as well to convince cities and citizens that we actually could control emerald ash borer and the trees could be saved. 
We'll talk more about the mistake in just a few moments. Now, a little money is directed to educating citizens, professionals, um, and others on practical urban forest preservation. There just is not a lot of energy placed on how we can save city trees. Huge delays have slowed the implementation of practical and timely solutions. And once again, egos have gotten in the way. As pest outbreaks expand, they amplify the cost and damage while we're all trying to figure out what to do. And this is really a good example of why it is worth fighting for what we know is right as soon as we can make a difference. And believe me, each of you on the phone can make the difference in your marketplace. This is Bartlett, Illinois in 2010. Uh, I was there, so were some of my people, talking to the city council about what was coming. They had the highest number of ash per, uh, per city of its size. I want to say they had 38% ash in their city. And it was first discovered in 2010. Just three years later, most of the susceptible trees were dead. And the only trees that survived were when a private citizen activist convinced their street to spend the money to treat the trees themselves. All of those trees are dead, all 38% of the canopy. You've heard this before. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Most people use that as a humorous uh, example of what you shouldn't expect from government. But local government prepares for a wide-ranging devastating issues, floods, storms, fires. Insect and disease problems are often beyond the scope of local government. And when APHIS gave back EAB to the, to the citizens, to the cities, to the states, there was no city expertise or any ability to form consensus solutions. They just didn't know what to do. When APHIS said we can't stop its spread, the media read that as nothing can be done. It's a really important problem that we had. We can't stop its spread, nothing can be done. When, we, when APHIS talks, about those things, the media looks for the most emotional response. It's going to kill everything. When the truth of the matter was they couldn't eradicate it, but we have demonstrated through the years across the country that it can be managed. Efforts to correct these bad messages have taken 12 years, and every time there's a new state that has a problem or a new pest appears, we have to start all over again as if we had just started this conversation yesterday. So what are the government limitations? Well, at the city level, they include lack of technical expertise, no funding for a crisis, scant research to guide decision makers, power struggles, and factional disagreements. Um, I think we'd all agree that that sort of describes most of, uh, most of our politicians and our governments uh, today, unfortunately. When the EAB problem, as an example, reached its peak of movement, it was right at the time that the economic downturn occurred in 2008. And, and it, the cities had absolutely no money for things such as this, and there was no government spending either. For Emerald Ash Borer, and I use that as our largest example, there are many others that we can talk on, uh, with volumes of conclusive data and strong field proof, communities are that are, that are discovering EAB for the first time are still developing plans based on outdated and factually wrong data, misinformation on environmental facts, misinformation on treatment efficacy, and on cost. Some cities elect to remove and replace healthy trees, while science and the financials demonstrate that treatment is highly effective, less costly, of lower environmental impact, and actually preserves community forests. This is enormously frustrating. You know, facts should matter in these cases. There was a study done at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, and it was done a number of years ago. You can see at the bottom, it was in the proceeds from the ISA, uh, proceedings from the ISA 2010 conference by uh, Van, Not Van Natta. <clears throat> they considered four management options at that time. Let's take no action. We'll let whatever insects come in, come in, kill the trees, and we'll deal with it later or preemptive removal before EAB arrived and replace the trees with young trees, or preemptive removal and no replacement, or treatment of all ash with some insecticide, and it wasn't even specified what that insecticide might be. And the results show that treatment provided the best total value, the best value for the community. 
Preemptive removal and preemptive removal and replacement provided less value than treatment over a 20-year model that they looked at. And what they found was that prolonging the life of large mature ash trees gave exponentially greater benefits through home values, energy savings, and ecological improvements. I have heard repeatedly that people were going to take down the, lar the large trees. This is exactly the opposite of what these kinds of studies have demonstrated. The large trees hold the greatest value to us. This is the result of their study. They used two separate methods of studying. So the black and the red simply mean uh, or represent two separate means of studying. And the, be the benefit to cost ratio is evident here. The higher the cost-benefit ratio, the better the solution. You could see removal obviously represents the poorest benefit. Removal and replanting was better, but the treatment process, the prolonging of large mature ash, was the best solution. These are the kinds of studies that are available for you to help you support the notion that what you're doing isn't just to make money, it's to make the most sense and preserve the community as you expect your, your customers would want. Let's look at funding responses to invasives. Trees are structural assets for cities. They actually have a value. Everyone knows what, what the standing value of, of their trees are. But when, when politicians look at them, uh, frankly, they're looked at as having little financial upside. They require pruning. They're damaged in storms. They cost to plant and maintain and to eventually remove. So there are costs all the way along the budget for those politicians who are responsible for developing budgets. For citizens, tree planting feels good. Frankly, all you ever hear about is a charitable outreach of planting trees. Uh, Arbor Day is coming up. Everyone wants to plant a tree. <clears throat> so saving existing trees seldom merits those good feelings. While science shows us that preserving mature trees offers the greatest long-term benefit, wouldn't it make sense to save trees instead of just planting trees to feel good? Removal and replacement is not the better option. So then one might ask, well, can't university extension lead? Let's talk about university extension briefly here. It was developed to disseminate scientific research from land-grant institutions on a wide variety of agricultural concerns for their constituents. Back in the days that this was developed, which was often in the 1800s, uh, the needs and the demands and the urgencies were very different than they are today. It was not designed as a system to respond to rapidly evolving pest situations. Let's face it, it could take all day to go 10 to 20 miles uh, in a, in a horse-drawn cart. This was not a problem where we were moving pests around in the matter of a blink of an eye. The frequency, the intensity, and the enormity of the new pests is unprecedented, and, and they overwhelm extension. They are not prepared for this. Non-university local extension agents, and you know those folks, you can look them up online, the folks who talk on everything from homemaking to canning vegetables uh, to fruit, con uh, fruit management, these are the people that the public depends on. But yet the information they receive is often delayed and often outdated. I've seen this over and over again where suggestions they're making are based on information that's three, four, five years old. And funding for critical research cannot be consistently expected from government or from universities. So where does that funding come from? That comes from those of us in private industry. <clears throat> Believe me when I tell you, these are not the least kind words I have heard. Liars, cheats, snake oil salesmen, ambulance chasers. Not only have I been called that, probably some of you have as well. And the problem is when you introduce a concept to try to prepare people in advance for a disaster, they often distrust you, whether it's a product of our society or it's just the way things are today. You have got more convincing to do uh, than just trust me. Universities have got to partner with folks like us to support research with new chemistry, fill funding deficits, and even provide research assistance, assistantships to the students. That's part of that partnering that occurs. So we want research conducted. There's a serious demand for it. A graduate student's uh, stipend can be covered by the money that we contribute to help do the research with a, a local university. 
Now, healthy skepticism is absolutely needed, but trust for valid scientific research for, by for-profit companies, frankly, it's essential. To appear more objective, some university researchers have presented pest solutions as alternatives instead of ranking performance against the pest at hand. So they literally will say, here are all the choices. You sitting in my lecture, figure out what you want to do. Now, I understand why they do that, because they don't want to appear preferential, but it leads to confusion, mixed signals, and a lack of clear direction for you guys, the professionals in the industry. Here's an example of a chart with far more information behind it in which a whole slew of products were tested. And this is not a young, this is an older slide now. But the message that was conveyed to folks was, hey, there are all these different options. Well, there are. There are a bunch of options. But did they control this insect well? The message should have been generic in nature in the sense that this particular active ingredient outperformed all the rest, not because I or Arborjet wants to grow their business. It's really so that you sitting in a lecture hall goes out and treats a customer's property with complete confidence that you're not just going to reduce the number of insects, you're going to stop the tree from dying because that's what you get paid to do. Now, city priorities, they differ enormously from private citizens, so let's look at that for just a moment. First, we've got economic impact. So the cities consider this as one of their key indicators. Will treatments work or just delay tree death? What will it cost to treat trees, and how long will I need to treat them? What are the real costs in removing and replacing trees? Many times I've heard, well, we've got the chippers and we've got the people already working here, so we'll just cut those trees down and it's going to be a, a real piece of cake. It's often significantly underestimated. What other economic costs are associated with treatment? What are those factors as well? And then there's the political impact. Do not diminish the role of politics in how cities consider what we're going to do about invasive pests when they arrive. How will decisions like saving or cutting down trees affect public perception? Public perception of the elected and appointed officials. How are you going to feel about your mayor if he does uh, tree protection or cuts all those trees down? What will, it, what will it do to his ability to stay in office? It matters. And what do recent polls reveal about citizen expectations? Let's look at that. There's a complete poll done back a few years ago done by the PPP organization out of North Carolina who, who tested or inquired with oh, I was on just under 600 residents in Minneapolis uh, on a number of questions. They were facing EAB and the park board was suggesting that they remove all 30,000 ash trees. And one of the most critical answers that we, we uh, heard was that we believe that mature trees are valuable to our home and neighborhood and are worth preserving. 93% of those residents said, save our trees. And you know, it's, not, it's never personal until it's your trees. These three trees, as you can see, are ash trees in front of these apartment complexes. This is in Chicago. Across the street is a big open ball field. These trees provide the only shade and cooling for this particular community of residents. Without those trees, you can imagine how hot and miserable it would be. The city did save those trees, but this is why it's so important to understand what it's like for a citizen versus the folks who are making decisions at a city level. They have to be considered because the citizens expect something different from their leaders than what they may get. And the problem is that the leaders need the guidance from people like you, the professionals, on what the best course of direction is instead of strictly looking at the most immediate thing in their face, which may be what is the cost. This happens to be a street uh, that some of you may have seen these pictures before. This is the same street, um, roughly a few days time difference. And you can see that on the left, the street looks rather pleasant. It looks like a nice middle class neighborhood, nice trees growing. And, um, and all of these houses appear to be very nice until you cut all the trees down. And then you, you look a little closer, you realize You've got homes that were built in the 50s or 60s. They're all ranches. They're all very close to one another. And suddenly, they have no sense of community. They've lost their forest, their urban forest. And the worst part was that these trees were taken down preventatively. There were no insects in them at the time of removal. So what are the city priorities continued? 
public safety. This is a very big one for cities. In fact, one of the biggest risks they face is when tree branches fall that are owned by cities and injure property, uh, damage property, injure people, kill people. Um, the city of uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, at one point had 11 lawsuits pending for falling branches when EAB spiraled out of control there a uh, number of years ago, and it was because branches were falling on property. So what are the risks associated with dying trees and the potentially rapidly declining canopy? What impact might lawsuits have on actual city costs with some treatments or removal strategies? Just because something is less expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's better for the city. So the city deciding to, to make one method its preferred method because it's less expensive may still result in tree death, which ultimately results in lawsuits, which ultimately cost the city a lot more money. And all of that needs to be brought to the city's attention when they're considering what to do about their trees. And environmental impacts, what are they? What are the environmental impacts of various treatment protocols? And are there measurable impacts when trees die or are removed? There are. And do they understand them? They need to. When uh, in one particular community, the elms died back uh, during the, the peak of Dutch elm disease, the additional water runoff caused such serious problems with the streams and of ultimately the lakes that it cost them $15 million back then just to reclaim and clarify the lakes following the removal of all of these elm trees. So yes, there are enormous environmental impacts if you cut down all of the trees. So when you cut trees down or trees die, one of the things that people tend to forget when they plant new trees, which of course we'd expect to happen in those cities that can afford to, is that it's the permanent loss of the existing urban forest. It's changed forever, at least in our lifetimes, it has changed forever. The replacement trees require generations to grow and mature. Increased stormwater runoff and outdoor water consumption occurs. Some of you that have heard my lectures before know that in one particular city, they cut down 3,000 trees in advance of EAB arriving, Emerald Ash Borer, and the, the demand for water in the non-shaded areas increased significantly, so much so that the water board raised the rates to the entire community by 10%. So everybody was paying more for water because suddenly everyone was using more water. Everything matters that we do. There's an enhanced heat island effect greater heating and cooling costs. There's a significant property value reduction, like those homes I showed you, where all of those ranch homes were suddenly devoid of any kind of, of shade. Neighborhood changes as a result. There's a loss of neighborhood character. Most of us choose the home in the neighborhood we prefer when we can do so because we like the neighborhood we're choosing. When we lose the neighborhood character, it matters to our citizens. And it adds stress on the poorest neighborhoods because it increases the cost to maintain heat and cool homes, and there's an even greater decrease in property values. Let's look at a couple of adjoining blocks in Cleveland. Looks like a really nice street. It's got lots of shade, beautiful, mature trees. These happen to be all ash, and they are in the 30 to 35 inch size class. And these Lawn areas in which they're growing are just slightly larger than the norm. They probably are in the four to five foot range. This is the very next block. Now, they don't have those large tree lawn areas, but look at the difference from one block to the next. One has to say, where would you prefer to live? And I know all of you, the answer would be uh, on the block on the right. These trees were all destined to be taken down. We actually worked with the city and worked with the community to save these trees. When you want to talk about the significance that mature trees can make, take a look at the map on the right-hand side. I'm going to add a, a little box in a moment, but you can suddenly see where these mature ash trees were. I'll, I'll go back one. Looking at that, you can see the significance of the mature ash trees to that particular street. And that is that street on the left-hand side there. So there's a real positive that comes when communities do not lose their urban canopy. So what are the roadblocks we face? Well, there's a perceived cost of treatment versus removal. People tend to look at very casual numbers instead of looking at full details. 
Should you run into those conditions, we can all help you in looking at the true cost of removal and the true cost of treatment. There are environmental arguments. People worry what, what we're going to do. I've actually had a city councilor tell me I was pouring toxic waste into his community, which is as absurd as it could possibly be, especially since we had just recently injected his tree in front of his house to protect it. Um, this is the kind of craziness that happens in the political arena. What is the value of trees to the city and its residents? You know, there are some cities that the people love their trees and others where they're just not engaged. And what are the factors affected by urban canopy? We talked about heating and cooling, stormwater management, huge, huge issue. A single tree will typically collect on its leaves 2,200 gallons of water a year that then evaporate. And we're not even talking about what the root system takes in. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, when we lose that tree, we suddenly find ourselves with millions of extra gallons going into a stormwater management system. And in most of our older cities, that management system is frankly antiquated. We talked about property value and stream and lake clarity. But one of the things we didn't talk about is that in cities, <clears throat> excuse me, in communities where there is uh, a good urban canopy, crime is lower. Cities become livable. Pollutants are reduced. And then we have to compare that against those cities that look at their standing timber asset value and decide, is it worth saving it? Or do we cut it down and try to regain some value from the removals? And then we've got lower voter knowledge. You've heard this term used a lot in the last several years. But what we're really talking about there is if people don't know and don't know what, to, what questions to ask and just trust their government and their government doesn't have the answers, the end result is we get bad decisions made. So what do we do when all the talk is about chainsaws? <clears throat> the most important thing is gaining stakeholder agreement on solutions. I find this when I, when I go out to talk to cities all the time. There are city officials, the politicians, public works, forestry, or parks people, they have to be on board for you to move forward beyond your residential customers to get people engaged in saving the trees, whether it's polyphagous shot hole borer on the West Coast, whether it's oak wilt in the center of the country, uh, whether it's southern pine beetle across the southeast, or emerald ash borer, or in the case most recently in New England where gypsy moths went crazy again and we had millions of acres defoliated. City officials need to get engaged. And it requires folks like you to go and talk to them about the facts. The public. We often use Facebook to help spread the word. Your websites can do the very same thing, bringing to their attention what the problems are and that there are solutions and what to look for and how to make sure that your trees are protected. Things like Google AdWords are another very cool little uh, tool that we can use. And we will use Google AdWords for people who are clicking on interest in a particular pest or problem, and we will use marketing as you should to help discuss with the public what the problems are and what the opportunities might be to protect and save their trees. Then media has a role as well. Uh, the media can be, in fact, your friend. In many cases, as we know, the media has been uh, challenged uh, and uh, accused of all kinds of things, but media is, sells its message based on something important. And while you're not going to be lecturing anyone about crime and about any of those kinds of things, the, the notion that you can do something about a serious problem is a message that sells to the media, such as um, protecting iconic trees or protecting trees in front of the library or in front of the city hall and doing so for free and inviting the media to see how it's done. I can guarantee you it makes a difference. The day after we treated the trees in Cleveland for the second time, the local True Green who was participating with us in that particular injection on that street got over 400 calls for people to come out and treat their trees. What a fabulous in invite that occurs when the media is engaged. The roles of local gardens. Every one of us has some public garden somewhere in our communities. You need to engage public space managers, resorts, the people that contribute to the economy, the leaders, the directors that are engaged in philanthropy. 
and whose words add credibility to your argument. Get those people on your side. Offer to help them. Uh, many of you don't know, but there are meetings and organizations of public gardens. Get involved. Become a member. Find out what you can do. And then demonstrating, as we talked earlier, showing hesitant people how to do it. It's a powerful thing when people see you treating a tree in a manner that is environmentally responsible and doing so in a way that is far less costly than removal and replacement. So how can city councils help? Here's what we've learned. You need to find a few of them who favor retention of trees from among the city council. It doesn't need to be everyone. Just a few people, either on the city council, on the park board, or other elected official, officials that have, have said, you know, maybe we're rushing a little too headlong into this process. Maybe we need to think about this a bit further. Make sure when you talk to them, you give them discussion that's relevant, short, and compelling. They don't like lengthy opinions. Focus on cost, safety, public perception, and environment, the things that matter to cities that don't matter as much to private residents. You can ask us to help you both plan and speak, and we can support you. We can give you the research, the science, the financials. We can help you with all of that, and we can even come to your city council and help you to present. There are all kinds of visual aids that cities use themselves, but that you as private companies can use as well, such as identifying what the value is. And this is information that you can get from an app that we have or from iTree. There are any number of different ways literally attaching tags to trees to talk about their value, what they contribute, and how you can save them. I've actually seen people attach tags saying that they saved that tree and that if you want your tree saved, call us. There are lots of ways that you can use marketing visually to help you. You can also use the city's own public information campaigns. You can piggyback with private citizens in this way. Door hangers that explain what's going on, special contractor pricing, for private trees versus city trees. City newsletters or mailers go out, PSAs occur. How can you benefit from all of that? Awareness ribbons, which I talked about briefly, tree valuation tags, and, and involving the media. All of these are ways that you can foster your own business or help the city to make good decisions based on all of the facts. So what are the prospects for the future? Despite all of the tree industry group messaging, professional polls that demonstrate citizen support saving trees, and even statements from universities supporting preservation of urban forests, the message all too often falls on deaf political ears. Let's face it, when they're worried that they can't pay the, the retirement fund of the fire department, they're less thinking about the value of trees to the community. In a political in climate where environmental protection is less in favor today, uh, it turns to us, you and I, as stewards of the environment to champion the urban forest preservation. Over the last decade, many new invasives have arrived, and international trade and travel are only going to accelerate the risk to our native trees. Climate warming is going to fuel native pest explosive growth, which can be just as devastating. Invasive pests already here will kill trees when environmental conditions like heat or drought favor them, or they reach the susceptible trees. You know, a pest that lands in the port of Miami may not have a species of tree down there that it can devastate, but if it somehow makes its way to New England or to California, could turn the difference and make the difference between life and death on trees. These two, these two pests in particular that I'm showing you here, uh, polyphagus on the bottom and uh, mountain pine beetle, are two examples of pests that have gotten out of control. University research is not disseminated quickly enough, and funding is often limited. So this reduces the effective dispersal of this information and outcomes. We just don't get the word out fast enough to everyone that needs to know, to all stakeholders. We've got to work with the government to identify the threats, reach and share effective solutions, and, and then we need to ensure that they actually implement them, that they actually do something instead of kicking the can down the road. Tree removal can target a single host pest, like emerald ash borer, because it only attacks ash trees, or a small group of trees within a confined geography. But it's unlikely that we can cut our way to solutions which offer effective results now or preserve the, the promise of our city forests for the future. 
We simply can't cut our way out of these problems because there is always a new pest and always a new species that is at risk. With the right invasive pest, lack of suitable pest predators in challenging environment, we can expect one tree after the next to come under attack. We are already seeing that happening. And we risk the destruction of our urban forests, which frankly are critical to our cities and often taken for granted by our citizens. Decisions to remove or protect infested or at-risk trees, well, it's a hotly debated uh, uh, communication. And the info used to make these decisions is either poorly understood or missing. And that's where you and I come in to try to straighten things out, to help people look at the facts instead of the mythology. Tree removal strategies do not address underlying causes of outbreaks and are simply unsustainable arbicultural practices. There are lots of assessment tools that exist to consider the value of tree canopy, from iTree to uh, and the ArborJet app and others, and to fairly compare those metrics to removal. You've got to demand that people use those tools and deem unacceptable any decisions that are made just for political expediency. It's not enough to say, I'm just going to have these trees removed because I do not know how to deal with all of the information that I need to consider. We should neither fear the science nor its conclusions, regardless of the takeaway, because opinion, it has no place as we seek to preserve our shared urban forests. And that's all I've got for you today. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I want to thank you for listening to this brief conversation. Zach, have we got any questions at all thus far? And if not, would anyone um, like to ask a question? We don't have any questions yet, but again, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can just type in the little talk box that you have one, uh, or just type the question in, and we can get you answered. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone for coming today. I know it's getting to be a uh, busy season for the majority of the company, uh, the country, so it's nice that uh, people are taking you know, 45 minutes to an hour out of their busy day to um, uh, to come to this.